How do I initiate this momentum for them? How do I get them out of their seat acting more than I do? Right? And part of the part of what you have to do first, this is kind of back to the screen, you know, world, is you have to reclaim, you have to just simply take back everything. Now, what is everything? I don't know. Do it needs a set, do an interest inventory for your child. Okay? Whatever their interests are, that's the stuff you want to reclaim. And you want to use as a very powerful teaching tool to discriminate. Privileges versus rights. Privileges are, we all know this because we're adults, privileges are earned, rights are given. Isn't it helpful for our children to logically understand the relationship between those two worlds, right? Isn't that fulfilling as, as independent young adults to be able to independently take control of their life and earn privileges that they want? Absolutely best thing we have going. I mean, so this is just some of the items. You just, you, you're not, kid does horseback riding, great, write that down. But you want to use all of that, not as punishment anymore. It's when they're not, they get punished enough. Right? It's just about using these as opportunities to teach and using them as privileges earned for their ability to prioritize, complete tasks, overcome challenges, read, right, whatever it is. Whatever's hard and in their way, okay? By doing that, you can now start to engage motivation. Motivation is simply that internal part of them or us that says, you know, that helps them to move forward with a level of purpose and consistency towards a goal. Now, you've initiated the goal by helping them see your expectations, right? You've initiated momentum or motivation by engaging them in what they want. Behavior 101, you're not, this is not rocket science, but in the weeds of parenting, it can kind of feel pretty you know, hard to figure out, right? But I've had parents say, well, how do I take everything back? I, I sit in the language of it, I said, you know, in some cases, you take everything back and you say, until further notice, because I haven't figured out how to do any of this yet, right? But until further notice, here's the expectations, I wanna see how you perform. Why, and one thing that's really, really important in this journey is um, is what we get really good at is the yo-yo effect. Like, I take something away, I give it back. Take something away, I give it back. Take something away, I give it back. What you want to teach is long-term, right, habits. Right? So helping them see that privileges are earned over sustained effort versus immediate effort. They're really good at immediate effort. Right? They can do anything for three days, even five. <laughs> it's the sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth. It's the month goes by. Whoa. Who here was grounded for a month as a kid? Anybody? Nobody was grounded for a month. Wow, we have really good people in this group. <laughs> oh, okay, cool. So, so part of that is a lesson, right, in, in you know, that certain, certain things have a sustained... You know, you have to work a sustained amount of time to achieve, right? So it's okay for us to tap into that and use these privileges as opportunities and take control. Okay? So how do we back off? We back off by kind of developing a mantra that says to ourselves, it's not my problem. I have to stop giving solutions and problem solving. I have to. If I don't, I will not create the space needed to help them solve problems. Because we're so good at it. Mm. We're so exceptionally good at solving their problems that they don't even know it's a problem. <laughs> right? Like getting up in the morning. And I, I use that again. It's not always a big deal. But, but I use it as a big deal because it can be. It can symbolize everything. For certain kids. Other ones, no. They do great all day and they just don't get up in the morning. Okay, fine. Not a big deal. So, but here's some categories to think of. It is your problem if you're the one managing the schedule, right? It is your problem if you're the one that cares about their social life. It is your problem if you're the one who cares about their SAT tests and when they're scheduling them. 
versus no, the expectation is that they dot, 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 right? So you, you start to shift the attention off of you and onto them. Now, some kids want, so it, this is really important. I'm, I'm putting across all categories, and you're like, well, it's not all, yeah, I know. But you have to start somewhere. You have to say to yourself, not my problem, and then what, right? And then what? And then I start to ask questions, probing questions, metacognitive questions, critical thinking questions, problem-solving questions. I know the answer. <laughs> I don't have to ask the question. But my kid doesn't, and that's the fear. My kid is so good at the blame game. My kid is so good at saying, I forgot. Right? Oh, I forgot. What? They're so good at taking the minimal, taking the, the easy way out of problem solving that we're no longer going to accept that as excuses. So we're gonna to start to create as many opportunities as possible. And try to have fun with it, because again, this isn't a journey that's supposed to be punishing to you. But you have to see the opportunities. And if it means missing soccer practice, then you miss soccer practice to take advantage of the opportunity. Why? Because the opportunity to grow metacognitive skills is far more powerful to whether or not they can score a goal as a forward. So that's why. That's why. <clears throat> so I'm, um, I'm going to get to kind of operation defining collaborative problem solving but, um, in, in the next slide. But this is out of Ross Green's work, um, which Think Kids at MGH, they've split up. But um, um, really awesome. I'm going to kind of teach you a little snapshot of how to do this. But this is really for the explosive kid, the kid that has really good at having temper tantrums, really good for meltdowns, right? And their dysregulation in how they problem solve incidences is to just go from like zero to 60, right? But this can be a really powerful tool to help us keep out of the problem solving world and engage our children in the thinking process. Um, combating learned helplessness is really the name of the game too, is, is always engaging our children in the problem solving process so they feel capable. That's, if they don't feel capable, they don't feel like they can solve a problem. And there's, that's where learned helplessness can be perpetuated. Um, discuss a plan and agree on a by when. Ask clarifying questions. When, where, what if. So if you ask what's your plan 100 times in the course of this next year, by the 90th time, they're going to get better at answering it. So the first 90, expect to help them a lot. But don't give up. Because this is the most powerful thing you can do to help them. You're, you're, I notice you're struggling to get up in the morning. What's up? Right? There's so many other things you could say. <laughs> but to take that as an opportunity to engage them in a problem-solving moment is going to be far more worth your time and attention. Right? <clears throat> and nightly check-ins. Create a system. Create a consistency to check in with your children. Check in with them. In the chaos of life, it, it's so hard now. I was driving here thinking about old days when like kids just went out and played, right? And you could always talk to them at dinner time. And you could always, there was always downtime at night. We lose all of that. And therefore we lose opportunities to sit and reflect and think. But they don't sit and they don't reflect and they don't always think about the past, right? And they don't always think about the future. So again, seeing playing with, interacting with the future is very, very powerful, and it has to be guided, and it has to be instructed. Um, the tackling excuses, um, that's pro and again, um, you can do this in a number of ways, but catching it is the first step. Uh, how many of you have, you know, elementary, right, so elementary kids, we, we stop doing this when our kids kind of get old enough, but getting eye contact should still happen, right? If your child struggles with working memory deficits, which let's imagine they all do, and let's imagine by four o'clock in the afternoon, they all really do, give me your eyes. You know, I, I teach all day with high school kids. That's what I say, I wanna see your eyes. Like everybody stops. Because when you engage your eyes, you engage the rest of your energy. It's so powerful. So don't ignore this just because your child is old. 